Uh, thank you very much, uh, Monica and uh, Nando, for, for joining us today and uh, uh, talking on such an important topic as climate crisis. As you may be aware that Pakistan is going through a climate crisis. Uh, the flood that was climate driven uh, has devastated a huge population of Pakistan. Over 30% of Pakistan was drowned underwater. We have lost thousands of lives and hundreds of thousands of animal, uh, animals uh, during the flood. Uh, we have also lost uh, all the crops that was grown there. And, and now the people who are affected by it are without shelter, without food, without any medicine that they need to overcome or uh, treat, get the treatment for waterborne diseases. And in that situation that we are going through, I was wondering if you could help us understand how does anticipation help us uh, deal with such a uh, humongous challenge. So uh, please, uh, Monica, if you can start, that would be wonderful. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and um, to address such challenging times, uh, especially for Pakistan. Uh, and we solidarize with all the situation that uh, the people are suffering and is struggling to, uh, to overcome and to rebuild their lives uh, in facing of uh, uh, all these uh, natural disasters, as you said, affecting uh, food, uh, living conditions, work, and everything. Um, I um, I would like to uh, to mention one of the data of my latest survey, which was about the future, how our expectation about the future is, and in that I will pinpoint three results. This uh, survey was conducted with three hundred participants from all over the world. So I have represent, I had representatives from Asia, from Americas, from Europe, and so on. And the data is showing us that only 17, around 15% of the population of the global, this, um, of this data believes and trusts that we are going to achieve the 17 goals. So 80% are seeing that we are going to fail. And that's a failure for all of us. It's not only Pakistan. So this is one data. The other data is that how do you people feel about the future? And 80% say they are anxious. Anxiety is a feeling that is usually connected to the future. And especially when we have no control and no uh, other possibilities of managing future situations. So, uh, and that's a common uh, global feeling, not only uh, from Pakistan, but globally. And the third data on that is that um, climate crisis is so severe that um, they, they think we need to, uh, that's also the data that's showing, we need to get trained, everybody, the whole world global community in basically four main like courses and one is first aid surviving skills that's something that we need to start addressing in schools for children so how do i survive if my city gets flooded what do i have to do how do i manage that so these things we 
have not covered so in the syllabus and in the educational uh, basic um, um, uh, course books uh, teachers teachers training we don't know we usually we we know how to call an ambulance and the fire brigade but that's it so that's the first thing the other one the other thing that people mostly uh, say about that is um, dealing with the effects of climate change, which is that's happening. Um, and then there are two factors that are also in the emotional level. One is kindness, which I never thought. I don't know how we can potentially create a course on kindness, but people are saying that that's something that we need to develop. And this week, I even uh, saw a video that um, a professor was saying that even hope is developed. It's something that we learn to have hope. And that is also a threat when we are thinking up about climate change and the future. Hope, which was something that we took for granted, is at bay, let's say now, because we can't foresee um, um, a very uh, positive future. The ones that, like the advertisements, are selling that we have, like, um, so we have a big division in terms of future, a future that is a disaster after the other. And at the same time, a future that is showing uh, advances in technology, advances in medicine, advances in house building. And, uh, but these two fut futures that we all live into um, has been creating, and that's also the data that is showing, that's the third thing that I'm going to say about this data collect, that I collected, uh, is showing a big division, a big gap between my future, the individual future, and the global future. And psychologically speaking, for the, for the person not to suffer so much, because we, we are suffering if when we see that, when we see the scenes, we get impacted, we also suffer. So people are creating a, a division in their ways of being between my future, which they are foreseeing positive, and oh, I'm going to grow, my kids are going to grow, and this is um, so um, a positive personal future. And when they look at the global future, they say, oh, it's going to be a disaster. So how these two things connect? They don't connect. So there is like a, a division, like a rupture between these two futures. We are people, and why people were doing that, my hypothesis is that that's not to suffer, that's to, a way to survive into so many challenges that we have. And when you said about all these things uh, into the future, uh, into what's happening with land and crops and uh, uh, floods, and all of this, which is not only in Pakistan, this is going to be more and more common in other regions. Uh, the, and also fires, because it's one or the other. You either have fire, and if you look at the NASA data of our planet, there are many fires going on right now on the globe. So it's fire or water, and these forces in many places, as we also saw in Europe last summer, in France, in Italy, and everywhere. It's a disaster. Um, and to battle that, 
the only thing that I foresee on the, um, individual, global, governmental organizations level is planting trees. Because the tree is going to absorb much faster the excess of water, is going to protect from the fire, is going to protect the crops. We don't understand, but the trees protect the crops. And we do have this, um, this um, I would say that it's a goal, it's a global goal of restoring the ecosystem. And the, the easiest, cheapest, and hands-on activity that everybody can do in their life is plant a tree. And if, if we have 7 billion people planting trees, this is going to impact the planet, the ecosystem, and also ourselves. They are protections. We don't see trees much like that, but they protect us immensely. If you have um, uh, from weather, from um, uh, pollution and all other threats. So I would, uh, if you ask me, so from the data I have and from what I've been doing, uh, quite often, as much as I can, is planting a tree. I'm going to um, show you. I got here at the department in Germany a small one, and this is I'm going to plant this one here. So wherever I go, I try to leave a tree. I hope this survives. I plant to say, oh, I pray that everything is going to be fine with you. But I do trust. Uh, we need to uh, foresee education in this kind of level for the future. I think it's basically that, um, but more and more, uh, we will need to uh, foresee, plan and execute activities in the face of tragedy. So uh, we will have to have plans when that happens. We will have to plan that out, uh, plant and out. There's another thing, not only trees, but fruit trees, because they can give fruit. So we are also on the verge of a big food crisis. And when you say that, oh, you lost the crop. People may think like, oh, they lost their crop. I'm going to go. They lost the crop. That means that the food that we are eating anywhere in the world is going to be more expensive. The world is well connected and globalized that if there is less food for you, this is going to impact my food as well, because it's going to be more expensive. I'll have to manage that. So I think we need a shift in consciousness and understand that in a crisis, we are all together. We don't have like, oh, this is Pakistan. Oh, it's far away. No, this is all of us. It will affect all of us. It is immediately affecting Pakistan people, yes. but it will uh, reach the others. And, uh, and there's no Noah's Ark to get out of this planet. The, we don't have the tickets to Mars. Mars, there's nothing in Mars. And we just have this planet where we live. And I watched uh, the other day uh, a talk from a very important professor, Deepesh Chakrabart from the University of Chicago. 
and he cited Stefan et al. from 2015. And Stefan et al. proved that all the destruction happened in the last 50 years, five zero years. So this means all this, the rise in the temperature, destruction of the oceans, acidification of the water and rain, all this in the past 50 years. So this is a big disaster. What we say, oh, we finished World War II. No, we didn't. Because this disaster is equal, equivalent to war. So uh, I do think we need to reframe and uh, understand that a globalized planet and uh, struggling to survive is a goal for everyone and that we need to educate, work and put our resources into that because that's what is going to impact more. It's living, food, a shelter, food, basic protections, basic health care, the basic of the basic, and, um, and uh, education for all to, to manage all these issues. And we should target this together because there's no way we can separate air, separate fire, separate water. This doesn't separate, this unifies all. And uh, we are into this together and we need to, it's time to um, get hands together and start really acting together so we can at least have potentially a little less suffering and disasters and uh, and that the weather doesn't uh, weather and all of this doesn't threat us so much because uh, the weather is there but we have been creating a way of having uh, e being easily um, uh, at a point of uh, destruction. And so we need to find ways and resources of uh, building that up. And thank you, Monica. Really appreciate. Uh, we don't have uh, we don't have much time. I'm, re I'm really uh, uh, we are short of time. I wish we had more so that we can listen to, uh, to your, your, your answer. And it is wonderful the way you have uh, made, created the whole picture of interconnectedness and interdependence. And uh, uh, I would like to hear from uh, Professor N Nando as well on the same climate crisis, how does future literacy helps us anticipate and deal with climate crisis. So Professor, please. I was, I was very much, uh touched by the description you made about what was what is happening in Pakistan. Uh, I'm also coming from a very poor family of farmers and uh, my grandfathers used to live with what they were producing by the by the by the land. So I know that is extremely devastating, but also it's a survival thing when you lose everything uh, and there is no other way to survive. Um, the problem with, uh, as, as Monica explained, the problem with climate uh, crisis is that uh, it's a global challenge. So no matter what people in Pakistan or people in India or people in, uh, in Greece are going to do, uh, it will not make uh, any difference. Um, the problem also in the case of climate crisis is that we more or less agree that we have a problem but uh, it has proved that we are incapable of taking any serious action towards uh, addressing the real problem and uh, the thing is that we are not ready to take serious action and we are not ready to serious action because we are not ready to change our uh, paradigm we have been uh, experiencing the last uh, at least 200 years we are experiencing 
uh, a world that we, it is built upon uh, specific values of continuous economic growth of uh, consumption. And uh, this uh, results in uh, extremely uh, ways of producing stuff, of uh, consuming energy, and exploring and exploiting the resources of, of Earth. So in this case, and now I'm coming to the heart of your question, uh, is, is where futures literacy can offer. Uh, we have been studying in our field uh, ways to expand the way of thinking, our creativity, find new ways uh, and challenge the old way of thinking uh, beyond our uh, our assumptions, because these are the assumptions that have created the problem. So we need new assumptions to find solutions. Uh, the problem is that for this, again, uh, is not enough for me, you, Monica, or a very, a very small community. So we need to find ways that, so that futures literacy and uh, long terminism is, is, is going to the curriculum uh, of uh, secondary first and uh, students in, in universities so uh, gradually we can we can change this way of thinking and we can improve the way we uh, we address these kind of challenges and climate change is only one we have others but uh, definitely uh, futures literacy is the way to proceed but we need to 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 to, to spread the world and have futures literacy and futures thinking uh in in high schools in uh, universities in secondary uh, education uh the other question that uh, that results from um, uh, from uh, i mean the next question is the question of climate justice after this climate crisis our prime minister went to cop 27 and uh, told the world the situation which is unmanageable for the government because we don't have sufficient resources to deal with it and he is asking for help and support, uh, and uh, he is asking for about $30 billion, which is a big deal of money. Uh, at the end of the COP27, we have seen a resolution principally accepting the, uh, the responsibility to help these vulnerable countries. But who is going to make this payment? Is it going to be the uh, Global North, which has uh, contributed a great more deal in uh, climate uh, driven change and climate pollution and benefited a lot uh, through industrialization or is it also going to be the emerging economies like China and India who are polluting the environment because of the industrial growth now but they have not benefited as much as that of the global north. So in the middle of it we have the victim of this climate change in Pakistan and in Nigeria this year who are waiting for help. If you do not feed them today, they won't have any food. If you don't give them medicine today, they won't have any medicine. Uh, and, and then we have global conflicts uh, going on. We have economic uh, recession. Global economic recession is on the door. Considering all these factors and also anticipating that we are going to see more frequent climate driven change in the form of floods, droughts, diseases. So how do we achieve climate justice in this whole situation? Uh, Professor Nando, if you could uh, start with it and we'll try to keep it as short as possible because it's already been 25 minutes and we have uh, another 10 minutes to add to it. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, this is a very uh, challenging issue, uh, climate justice. I'm not very optimistic because I don't have any, any ways or any signals to be optimistic about this. You are right. Uh, it's uh, it's the Western North that have actually made most of the damage uh, in the previous uh, centuries. Of course, there is a big excuse. We didn't know at that time about climate change. So uh, the, there is an excuse. And uh, maybe still it's the Western economies uh, that still make a lot of the problem uh, although the, we just have moved our production from Europe or from the United States to China, to Pakistan. So uh, maybe we blame China, but a lot of the products that are produced in China are consumed in Europe and in the States. So still there is a lot of uh, um, injustice, let's say, taking place. 
um, maybe uh, the problem is, is still uh, many decades uh, uh, ahead to be solved. I'm not very optimistic because I don't see any serious mindset change. Uh, you're right. We have to find a uh, way to fund, uh, um, to fund uh, this kind of uh, mitigation uh, activities to address the problem uh, in Africa, in, in, in South Asia that uh, are caused by climate change. And we need to change this paradigm because, again, uh, you talk about economic recession. I'm not sure if there is a problem about this. I mean, we have uh, we have been taught to think that economic recession is a problem. But if we change the way of thinking, maybe what we need is disciplined growth and then economic uh, recession will not be any problem anymore. So all of these are issues that have to be put on table, but we need definitely a new way of thinking and to uh, uh, challenge everything that we are taking for granted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nando. Uh, Monica, please, uh, if you could also talk about it. I'm, I'm neither optimistic. I'm with Nondas and uh, I think uh, Einstein was very um, wise to say that it's easier to disintegrate the atom than to change human mind. Uh, I also think there's a lot of hypocrisy in this field. And uh, of course, we know that the ones that pollute more are not doing their part and uh, everybody's suffering. And maybe they're thinking that uh, uh, the consequences are not going to reach, but it's already reaching them because the price of energy is going up, the price of food and cost of living and inflation, inflation is all back. And I think people just change when they are really impacted by something. Uh, and, and, then, and then they change. And the justice, as you said, um, I, I think this is, this is already changing. I think uh, this, uh, there's a lot, the South Hemispheric countries don't uh, know how much importance they have and uh, and they uh, and in this globalized world everybody's important nobody's better than anybody in the crisis that's another thing uh, it's somehow uh, it will bring equality uh, not to the one that uh, somebody's putting inside the others but when everybody's into a crisis uh, that's equality that that's going to come somehow and um, and we know, uh, as I said, the hypocrisy because people were still going by private planes to COP27 and all this kind of thing that we know people don't change their habits. They continue eating uh, fish that are um, on the threat of extinction and meat that uh, deplorates the, the, the planet even more. So it's difficult when people have to change and go into a more modest life. I, that's what I think. And then you are going to eat less because that's going to impact, bring a better impact to the planet. And uh, when we lose privileges, because otherwise we won't make it for tomorrow. I think somehow this is going to come even if it's not uh, the way we have a uh, portrait, uh, can be through pain and difficultiness, but it's going to come. Thank you. Okay, so that brings me to the third question, and this is about uh, uh, social responsibility of the businesses or the, uh, the industries and uh, those sections of the society who have been focused on making profit now, they, because of that focus, they have, uh, um, they have endangered the whole uh, climate system and they are part of the destruction of the nature that we see today. How do we bring them to pay for the damages they have done? Uh, uh, are the governments uh, able to, to do that? with the international uh, um, uh, um, business, businesses and uh, who 
I mean, what is going to be the model? Like, I mean, when we talk about increasing taxes, uh, there is a problem. When we ask them, uh, the, these multinational companies to pay taxes in the countries they are working at, there is a problem. Uh, there is also a problem of uh, these companies, uh, companies setting up their accounts in offshore places to avoid paying taxes. Uh, all these things are there, but how do we bring them uh, and make them responsible? Uh, like companies like Exxon, the, the company of fossil fuels, they have damaged the, the uh, whole uh, earth a lot. Uh, are we going to, uh, are we able to make them pay for the damages? What is, uh, what is the possibility if you could uh, very briefly touch on this, this particular uh, issue? Very quickly then. Um, I'm more optimistic in this direction, at least uh, on European level, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there is a framework of different regulations that actually work on this direction. And I'm sure that this will affect the global business environment. There is also a growing uh, effort and uh, things are going to the direction that uh, companies have to prove that they are having a very meaningful, uh, uh, let's say, policy towards climate change and, uh, and social responsibility. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not uh, that the problem is going to be solved, but there is a way. Uh, we need transparent, transparent governance. Um, Europe is not enough, but we need this kind of governance in Nigeria, uh, everywhere in the world, because uh, a lot of investments are taking on a national level. So we need the governance to play this role and uh, apply the rules. Uh, and we need, of course, the society to support these political decisions. And for this, we come back again to the issue of futures literacy of how and how we perceive uh, not only the present, but the future and the future of, our, of the next uh, generations. Yes, Monica, please. Yes, uh, I agree. We have to change the policies and have to change the rules, as you were saying. Uh, it's very tough because the big companies don't even pay tax. They, there's a great evasion of taxes uh, payment. Imagine if they're going to pay for all the damage. So it's... Uh, uh, we do have to go into that direction. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that to raise the awareness of consumers, so we know that, oh, if this is doing that, don't buy from this company, etc. So the, this uh, plays a lot of, of uh, change in the companies. And there's another thing, um, and work together into companies and governments, because as Nanda said, there's not so much transparency into that. Um, I recently saw a documentary called Organizations and all that they do and how they buy the Congress and everything everywhere. And uh, the thing is not uh, uh, to pass. Uh, rules in terms of um, um, uh, meat business and many other situations that we know that are just deploring the planet. Uh, but I trust a lot people. I think that uh, we, uh, people, when they become more aware of things, there's a, a big change into uh, although it's difficult, but there's a big change into the way they consume and the way that the big generations, when you said, I have a lot of hope on them. I think they, they are the millennials, especially from and the young ones, they, they are, they are already different. They are not like, oh, I want to conquer the world. I want to sell these and that. They, they, they are they, they say, no, I want peace of mind. I'm here. I, I'm going to eat if there's this to eat. I'm going to eat this. Uh, um, I don't want to have like three houses. I'm just going, doesn't make sense. I, I just need one. So they already have another mindset. And I'm hopeful that they will make things a lot better, different, more equal. And uh, and they will achieve what we have failed. Uh, so I I do trust them, and they they have also a, a lot more ethical 
uh, and equality in the ways that they they don't accept the things that we did. So thank you, Monica, and thank you, Nando's. Really appreciate your time. I wish we had more. Uh, so that we can discuss more details. I still have many questions that I wanted to ask you, but because of uh, the limitation of time, we couldn't. But I really appreciate and I understand the pessimism or a bit of hopelessness that uh, you guys have shared with us. And coming from this um, crisis, they, I feel I look at any person who's affected by this crisis, it is very hard for them to have hope when they don't have any food, they don't have any shelter, it's very hard to have hope that time. But as Monica had mentioned earlier, that hope is not something which you have, it is something that you build. So I hope that Pakistanis who are affected by this crisis would also be able to build this hope. And I'm also looking forward to the youth, uh, which are 64% in Pakistan, but this youth can be very helpful in building the nation, but without training, without education, with malnutrition, it is difficult to be too hopeful about it. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you both very much.